When the internet was developed, people often waxed poetic about what it would be used for. Because of the light speed connection and the ability to talk to people across the world in a matter of seconds, many believed it would be used to cure cancer in a matter of months, solve the world's most daunting issues, and make scientific discoveries that would change the world forever. Doctors and scientists would have access to all of the world's knowledge and be able to communicate with the smartest minds in the world in a way that was previously thought impossible. Many likened it to the Industrial Revolution and how quickly the world developed after other advances in technology and science. The internet felt like the next step, but no one could fathom just what would come from it. Being able to communicate with someone worlds away would no doubt bring people closer together, encourage healthy debate between communities, and bridge so many of the gaps that lie between them. Opportunities for misunderstanding and miscommunication leading to real-world problems would dwindle, as the ability to say what you mean quicker than it is misunderstood presented itself. Wars would be over before they even began. A click of a button could bring peace to whatever tragedy, and it truly felt like the next frontier. However, many of those same people were shocked to find that while the internet did bring people from across the world together, it didn't change the essence of who people were. It didn't, somehow, remove people's selfish and self-serving nature, and instead bolsters people's worst qualities. The addition of a screen in normal interactions added enough of a safety net for people to begin sharing their more deplorable thoughts and opinions, feeling as though they could do whatever they want with little to no consequence. Instead of seeing the internet used to healthfully debate topics and broaden an understanding between cultures, online forums dedicated to learning and broadening one's horizons quickly devolved into chaos, with people feeling the need to one-up each other. Debates became heated and toxic, with people going for the jugular over small, inconsequential misunderstandings. Misinformation ran rampant, with the creation of spam emails, clickbait, and computer viruses. And with the creation of chat rooms, people's worst qualities were placed appropriately on display. And there is no better example of that phenomenon than the person we are going to be covering today. Welcome to another episode of Dreading. Today we are going to be covering the case of Nathan Larson, a person whose online activity needs to be seen to be believed. During the research portion of this video, I found myself in complete shock at the things this man has said and done. And given the nature of this channel, that is quite a feat. This case was truly one of the most bizarre, as Nathan never tried to hide any of his terrible actions, like so many others do, but instead bragged about them proudly. This man truly is one of the most proud and deranged people we have ever covered. And before going any further, I want to clarify that while reading his manifesto and portions of his history, I in no way agree with or endorse any of his behavior. That should go without stating, but I still feel the need to make that known. I also want to clarify that I do like to do in-depth research in my videos, and I dive deeply into people's lives prior to the instances reported on. But there's virtually no information on Nathan Larson prior to him going to college, and even that, there is very little information on. Usually in these cases, due to public fallout, family and friends come forward and talk about their experiences with said person. But that is not the case here. No family has ever talked about what it was like raising Nathan or growing up alongside him, meaning that we have to take Nathan's word for a lot of things. Nathan, for what it's worth, posted quite a lot on the internet about his life. But how much of it is actually accurate remains to be seen. So if you find any portion of the video lacking or feel like there are holes in Nathan's biography, know that we did what we could but found very little. This video was suggested by one of our subscribers, The Green Beetle. But if there are any stories you would like to see me cover, please leave them in the comments down below. You can also email me if you would prefer to request a video privately. If you like true crime content and would like to see more of this channel, consider liking the video and subscribing. With all that said, let us begin. Nathan Larson was born September 19, 1980 in Virginia. He went to college to become an accountant at George Mason University, and it was there that he fell in love with politics. Nathan was someone who felt that he was above most other people. He believed that he was one of the most brilliant thinkers of our time, and that he needed to share his mind with the world, lest the world fall into despair. According to Nathan, he had the radical ability to think without emotions, using only the real facts, and see through so much of the emotion that gets in the way of debate. He felt as though people were too caught up in their own selfishness to see the truth in front of them, and the world had grown too soft because of that. He personally blamed the feminist movement, as he determined that structured debate and conversation had to be softened for women's weak and inferior minds. In an effort not to hurt anyone else's feelings and communicate with women, people had stopped being factual in their debates and just tried to appease people's egos, which led to a widespread social degradation. Nathan truly believed 
above all else, that the world could be set right if people just listened to him. The first time Nathan became politically active was while he was on campus at George Mason in 2002, when he spoke out against the school's anti-marijuana stance. The school, like most campuses in the United States at the time, would penalize their students if they were found with any marijuana on campus. Marijuana was illegal throughout the U.S., and so the school's penalty was in line with the government's overall stance. However, Nathan found this stance to be out of line. While on campus, he spoke out about decriminalizing the drug and was interviewed by the District Chronicles. However, very little was done to change the school's policy or create change overall. But Nathan wasn't swayed. If anything, he felt the lack of change meant he needed to do more. And so, after graduating from college, he began to pursue a career in politics. At first, Nathan registered as a libertarian, aligning himself with the party because of their overarching belief that government should be smaller and play less of a role in people's day-to-day -day lives. In 2008, Nathan attempted his first congressional run with the party. At first, Nathan was able to get some local support with his initial campaign promises of lower taxes and privatizing transportation and other areas of government. He argued that privatizing buses and the postal service would lead to better, more efficient services all around, and that the government had no reason to create those services in the first place. As his campaign continued, Nathan was offered the opportunity to debate his fellow candidates. Nathan believed that this was his chance. As a third-party candidate, he knew that people likely hadn't heard of him or what he believed in. But he felt if he used the debate as a chance to open people's eyes to another possibility, he would actually have a shot at winning the entire election. Though recordings of the debate have seemingly been lost to time, there is no one lone article detailing the events of the debate, and it was less than favorable to Nathan. The Flat Hat newspaper reported that Nathan's statements drew laughs from the audience multiple times, and people widely thought he was joking when he discussed his plans. When asked what he would do to improve the economy, Larson pledged to privatize various aspects of the government, and then shockingly stated that education should not only be privatized, but made optional. He later followed up that kids should be allowed to enter the workforce as early as 10 years old to prepare them for the real world. Nathan would go on to state, child labor laws should be eliminated. Some people are ready to begin work well before the age of 16. And today, there are many industries, including high-tech fields such as computer programming, to which young people can make a contribution without endangering themselves. He went on to state that getting a few years head start in the work world could benefit them and our economy and allow some education to be gained through on-the-job training, which the crowd couldn't help but laugh at. And finally, when asked how he would counsel the next president on bipartisan issues, Larson listed off books he would give him. By the end of the night, the people Larson had hoped to win over saw him as nothing more than a joke. His campaign ended with him receiving less than 2% of votes overall. But similarly to his first failure, this motivated him to do more. Nathan felt like the reason he hadn't been successful was because he hadn't gone far enough. In his mind, he had played it safe by stating he wanted to bring back child labor and make education optional. And in order to save the world, Old, he would need to do more. Unfortunately, this would coincide with the election of the 44th President of the United States, a man who Larson would take a good amount of issue with. On December 15, 2008, Barack Obama was elected President of the United States, making him America's first black president. And Nathan was furious. Because Nathan was not only sexist, he was also incredibly racist. Reporting on his life prior to this letter never addressed his racism. But Nathan held an incredibly deep belief that a white man was a part of the superior race and should be left in charge of everything. And after he failed to get elected to public office, he became more radical in this belief. He was an extremist in every sense of the word. And in his mind, Obama becoming president was was the worst thing that could have happened, due in no small part to his race. He believed that Obama, like all black people, had a weaker mind and would ruin the nation if he was to become president, which was something that Nathan couldn't let happen. In his anger, Nathan wrote an email to the United States Secret Service, detailing the way he planned to kill the president-elect. Although, due to his wording, certain articles stated he wanted to kill George W. Bush, while others state it was Obama. He would go on to clarify both to the Secret Service, as well as in his manifesto, that the threat was meant for Obama and Obama only. Though he said it wasn't sent because he was racist, he just didn't believe in government. The email hasn't been released in full, but according to the United States Attorney's Office, Larson started the email by writing, I am writing to inform you that in the near future, I will kill the President of the United States of America. 
He then went into graphic detail about how he planned to carry out the assassination and how they would be powerless to stop him. After receiving Nathan's detailed threat, the Secret Service flew out to Boulder, Colorado, where he was staying at the time, and interviewed him. Nathan stated that he stood by what he had said in the email and was serious about carrying out the threat, though he clarified the threat was only to Obama and not Bush as he had no issue with the current president. The goal of the Secret Service visit was to ascertain if Larson was a credible threat to the president-elect, as plenty of people have made flimsy threats to people in office without having any real plans to follow through. But Nathan was deadly serious. In his own words, if they didn't do something about Obama, he would be forced to. He went into even more detail about how he would do it, and according to the Secret Service members who interviewed him, he seemed to be relishing talking about the violence he planned to inflict on the president. He told them about the research he had done on the White House and the security protocols, and he joked that he could do their jobs better than they could because he googled how to. He likewise clarified that he didn't think Obama was really, quote, all that black. He was black enough for him to be considered a problem to the nation's security and reputation, though. After the interview, Nathan was arrested and then sentenced to 16 months in federal prison for threatening to take the life of and inflict bodily harm upon the President of the United States. He was sentenced to serve his time in federal prison, and unfortunately, things would only get worse from there. This portion of the video includes verbal descriptions of abuse, suicide, sexual assault, and rape, specifically towards a trans man. If that is something that you are not able to mentally take on, please pause the video now. If you want to continue watching, skip to the next chapter using the arrow keys on your keyboard, or look towards the description on mobile. Your well-being is more important than any watch time demographic, and I hope you have a great day. Nathan served 14 months of his sentence before being released. When he left prison, he had become more radicalized in his beliefs. Everything that he had felt and believed before going in was amped up to 11, and the few people around him noted the change. Where Nathan had believed that women had softer minds and weren't as smart as men, he now believed that women should be viewed as property, to be owned and controlled by the men in their lives. He viewed cases of domestic violence against women as training them to be submissive and beating the feminism out of their bodies. His racist belief system had gotten stronger as well, with him proudly spewing racial slurs in regular conversation. He was also openly a pedophile and actively announced his desire to have sex with kids constantly. If the justice system had thought that prison would rehabilitate Nathan and make him see the error of his ways, they were sorely mistaken. Sometime after his sentence in 2015, Nathan met a trans man named Finn. He had begun an incredibly abusive relationship with them. Finn's life before meeting Nathan wasn't an easy one. And though I won't go into any immense detail here, Finn was a deeply tormented person who struggled with his mental health prior to meeting Nathan. They struggled with self-harm and suicidal ideation and had begun to get professional help for their issues when he met Nathan at group therapy, which Nathan was forced to go to after his prison sentence. Nathan became fixated on Finn and all but forced him into a relationship. He controlled Finn, what he ate, who he saw, and when he could go to the bathroom, and all because he believed that he was superior to him in every way, and that he, being a trans man, should be entirely submissive. Due to Nathan's height and size, he was able to physically control Finn, and while they often tried to fight back, Nathan was able to overpower him. Nathan likewise didn't respect Finn's gender identity, only referring to them by female pronouns and their dead name, striking them when they cut their hair in a way that was too boyish, and by his own admission, raping him in order to try to get him pregnant. As Nathan felt, as a man, his ultimate life's goal was to breed, which unfortunately, he was able to. Finn was not in a healthy place when they had met Nathan, and he tried to leave the entire relationship, only for Nathan to threaten to kill him and everyone around them. Finn had spoken about feeling like a tremendous burden to his loved ones, and the idea that they would be hurt because of him was too much to bear. However, the moment Finn realized that he was pregnant, he decided that even if he was killed, even if Nathan beat him to death, he needed to try to get out to save the baby. Finn left Nathan and filed for divorce. They filed a restraining order against him. Though all the legal documents are not available online, in one, Finn described the abuse he received from Nathan, saying, During our relationship, He, Larson, was severely emotionally and sexually abusive towards me. He stated multiple times that he wanted to have sex with a child. He talked about how he would manipulate and trick the child into giving him sex. Told me he wouldn't love the child if they did not have sex with him. And stated he had no interest in children other than sexual. He raped me until I was pregnant and stated his intention was to have sex with my child after she was born. Finn had plenty of evidence to support his case as well. 
including an email that was sent from Nathan after he had originally talked about getting them pregnant just so we could have access to the child, which read, It didn't concern me that given my history of raping you, as well as the gravity of what I was proposing to do with the children, I might irreparably destroy our relationship and any prospect of ever seeing the children, especially unsupervised. In court, Nathan admitted that he had in fact said this, and he had raped Finn repeatedly, and the restraining order was granted. In posts Nathan would make on anonymous websites he owned and operated, he would also openly boast about abusing his ex multiple times over, having sex with them just to try and get them pregnant, and wanting to have sex with his own child. Nathan was incredibly straightforward about his pedophilic desires, publicly stating that wanting to sleep with children was a normal thing that society, and most notably, feminists, had tried to eliminate. Finn was able to leave and hide out until the baby was born. He made it a point to never tell Nathan about the child, and tried his best to take care of the child. However, he would end up taking his own life, and leaving his daughter in the care of his parents. One unforeseen consequence of his tragic demise was that Nathan, who had been otherwise unaware that he had fathered a child, was informed of her existence, and he wanted custody. In an article written about Nathan's venture to seek custody, J. Adrian Stanley wrote, Larson is a 35-year-old part-time accountant who lives with his parents in Virginia and is engaged to a citizen of the Philippines. Larson says he doesn't think he would molest his own daughter, but isn't sure, since he is quote, never been in that kind of situation before. He does, however, think it's okay for adults to engage in sexual acts with children, as long as there is what he refers to as consent. Although the age at which a child can consent to such activities depends on the child, he says, because some children are precocious. Any traumatic outcomes from these acts, he believes, are mostly the result of a child feeling betrayed or of the shame enforced by societal norms. I think society should leave it to individuals to experiment, he says. That's the only way we'll gain more information and learn what the truth really is. The article went on to detail some of Larson's other beliefs about incest, like when he took to the internet to say, The way I feel about it is that if I had a son, I don't think I would have any interest in engaging in those activities with him. My attitude would be, if he's going to be involved in incestuous activities, that may as well be with a sibling or his mother or something. Nathan went on to state that he believed that being a pedophile and talking about his want to have sex with his own children was a civil rights issue and something that should be protected under freedom of speech. He went on to say that as a man of the household, he should be allowed to do as he sees fit and raise his children the way he wants, and the way he wanted was to raise them to have sex with them. He believed that by taking the matter to court, he would be able to stand up for the overlooked and underrepresented minority that are pedophiles and convince the jury to let him have custody of his daughter. But the opposite was true. The jury was repulsed by him, and the judge stated that before they could move forward with any decision, Nathan would have to go to a psychiatrist so a risk assessment could be done. Nathan immediately backed down, telling the Colorado Springs Independent that he had done a risk assessment psychological evaluation years prior, and they had stated he should not be allowed around children unsupervised meaning that he wouldn't be able to get custody of his daughter. Nathan tried to turn the situation once more into him being persecuted for being a pedophile. He was quoted as saying, It's evident that when a patient says that he is attracted to kids and that he questions the harmfulness of adult child sex, the standard procedure of mental health workers is to recommend against the following unsupervised contact with kids. But it's hard to raise a kid without being able to see her outside the presence of a social worker. Nathan had suffered another loss, and just like before, he got worse. During the trial to gain custody over his daughter, Nathan's online activities were brought to the forefront. Since his original campaign for office, Nathan had begun maintaining his own websites, starting with Nathan Larson for Delegate.com. But as time went on and his ideas got more and more extreme, he began to create websites that would cater to his extremist wants and viewpoints. He owned the following sites. SUPED, which stands for Suicidal Pedophile, Inceloculypse, Raping Girls is Fun, Phintology, Near Cells, later changed to Rapey.co, which multiple YouTubers made videos about, Child Wiki, ChildPorn.info, TrueCells.org, BlackPill.is, Suicide Wiki, Nathan Larson 3141, NathanLarson.org, Stero, Lolly Hunter, Jizzy Coding, and more. Nathan aligned himself with the incel movement, though he stated he was voluntarily celibate. On these sites, he would write essays about vile topics under different usernames. On the Suicidal Pedophile Forum, Nathan wrote about wanting to have sex with his own daughter. 
stating, I just want to bang my own daughter, actually, but even if it were legal, I'm not sure it would happen, since I don't have custody. After sex with kids is legalized, parents or other guardians will still be gatekeepers to some extent, and a lot of them will want to bang their own kids and not share with others. I think that to get with girls, whether they are young or old, you'll usually need to have charm and or money. That's especially true if you're trying to get with more attractive girls. Once sex with kids is legalized, I imagine the competition to get in their pants will be fierce. He likewise restated his feelings towards getting someone pregnant in order to have children for the express purpose of sex. Asking on a separate forum, why doesn't every pedo just focus on making money so they can get a pedo wife and then either impregnate them with some fuck toys or adopt some fuck toys? That would accommodate both girls who are and aren't into incest. And of course, the adoption process lets you pick a boy or a girl. On Incelocalypse, he wrote an essay about how he escaped being an incel by raping his ex repeatedly, and instructed members of the site to do the same thing in an instructional post titled, How to Psych Yourself Up to Feel Entitled to Rape. Somehow, Nathan delved deeper into his own demented delusions and believed that he should once more run for office. He had played it safe before when he stated that children should be put back in the workforce as young as 10 years old, and time had only taught him that his extremist views were under attack. His viewpoint was needed now more than ever, and he set a goal to be the first pedophile in office, fighting for the rights of other pedophiles. In 2017, he briefly ran for office, but was unable to get any significant votes. In 2018, he ran again, this time as an independent candidate for the Virginia House of Representatives, as the Libertarian Party publicly expelled him and denounced his views, stating he was disgusting. Larson was unfazed, and in multiple interviews with the Huffington Post and local news stations where his pedophilic, incestuous incel forums were brought up, Nathan stated that, quote, a lot of people are tired of political correctness and being constrained by it. People prefer when there's an outsider who doesn't have anything to lose and is willing to say what's on a lot of people's minds. I want to warn you about this next story because a Northern Virginia candidate running for Congress has some shocking, dangerous, and downright disturbing views about children and women. Nathan Larson is an accountant who lives in Fauquier County. This is hard to read and certainly hard to hear. He admittedly thinks it's okay for adults to have sex with children. He even wants to make it legal. Northern Virginia Bureau Chief Peggy Fox is in Catlett, Virginia tonight, and she spoke to him. Normally, we don't give people with abhorrent beliefs a platform in which to share those ideas. But this man is running for Congress, and as much as I personally hate to put this man on TV, we believe it's important for people to know why he's running for Congress. Nathan Larson told me he wants to, quote, restore liberty and make incest legal. What about sexual relations with your own children? Like, I, I would favor, like, le legalizing incest. Why is that? just because uh, personal freedom. What about uh, the children's rights? Oh. Wouldn't that be rape to have sex with a child? Uh, well, like, like with girls, I mean, I just believe that it should be for fathers to make those decisions. And you don't find anything wrong with that? I mean, it's not for me to intrude on another family and tell them what they should do. Wouldn't that be really dangerous for children? I don't see how we know that. Like Children are human beings, they're not property. What about their protection? Oh, the law doesn't treat them as uh, having the full rights of adults. Nathan Larson also told me he doesn't think wives should be allowed to accuse their husbands of rape. Now, I talked to the Virginia State Board of Elections, and they tell me that Nathan Larson is not an official candidate because independence cannot be official until June 12th. But Larson says he's gotten the required 1,000 signatures and filed the paperwork. He's running in District 10, which is not where he lives. District 10 is represented right now by Republican Barbara Comstock. Larson's love of web design also led him to building the website NathanLarson.org, where he posted his campaign manifesto. Before going any further, I want to once again state that I do not agree with or endorse anything that is in this manifesto, which is filled with racism, anti-Semitism, sexism, and more. 
In portions of this manifesto, he goes into excruciating detail about how Hitler is his role model and a hero. If that is something you cannot mentally take, please feel free to exit this video now. It's absolutely abhorrent, and I want to make that clear before beginning. I will also be censoring any racial slurs present, of which there are a lot. I, Nathan Larson, hereby announce my candidacy as a quasi-neo-reactionary libertarian in Virginia's 10th Congressional District election, 2018. As representative, my main agenda will be 1. Stopping the war on drugs. 2. Protecting gun ownership rights. And 3. Putting an end to U.S. involvement in foreign wars arising from our country's allegiance with Israel. I will also restore number 4. Benevolent white supremacy. 5. Private borders. 6. Patriarchy. 7. Freedom of speech. 8. Freedom from age restrictions. 9. Suicide rights. 10. Jury trial rights. 11. Discrimination rights. And 12. Free trade. Stopping the war on drugs. Congress should repeal the Controlled Substances Act and shut down the Drug Enforcement Administration. This way states can set their own drug policies, much as they have set their own alcohol policies since the ratification of the 21st Amendment to the United States Constitution. It is commonly argued that if drugs are legalized, then people will succumb to their addiction to these substances and the streets will be filled with addicts smoking crack pipes and shooting up heroin. Actually though, what is typically far more addictive than drugs themselves is drug money. Many drug dealers who don't consume their product are nonetheless dependent on the drug money that funds the lifestyle they've grown accustomed to. With the money that they get from selling drugs, they can feed any number of non-drug related addictions such as sex, gambling, 23-inch rims, etc. The Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1986 authorized a 100 to 1 ratio sentencing scheme which equated a single gram of crack with 100 grams of powdered cocaine, based on a mistaken belief that crack cocaine is more dangerous than powder. The U.S. Sentencing Commission found that this legislation resulted in retail crack dealers getting longer sentences than the wholesale distributors who supplied the powder cocaine, and that 85% of the individuals sentenced under the 100 to 1 ratio were black. Both the Sentencing Commission and Lanny Brewer, head of the U.S. Department of Justice Criminal Division, asked Congress to reduce the ratio to 1 to 1 in 2010. Congress finally passed the Fair Sentencing Act, reducing the ratio to 18 to 1. While this is a step in the right direction, Congress should still act to reduce the ratio to 1 to 1, unless it wants to arbitrarily punish blacks more harshly for being small-time street corner drug dealers rather than big-time wholesalers, or for having a clientele that prefers their cocaine and rock rather than powder form. I see, however, nothing at all on Barbara Comstock's campaign website about the drug policy reform, which isn't surprising given she tends to support the same policies as Trump. While Julia Biggins' website mentions only sentencing reform and reduced sentencing for nonviolent offenders, and Jennifer Wexton's website has only a vague reference to reforming mandatory minimums, rather than anything explicitly referencing crack. Why isn't there a stronger commitment to ending this injustice from candidates of the Democratic Party, which claims to better represent the interests of blacks? Ultimately, though, what we need is complete legalization of all drugs. Otherwise, drug manufacturers and dealers will continue to go back to the drug trade once they're released from prison, since it's a business they know, and since their felony records preclude them from getting a decent job outside the underground economy. We need to keep people from going to prison at all for drug offenses by creating a legal market that will dry up the flow of illegal drug money and drive the street corner drug dealers out of business. We should also expunge the records of those who directly have criminal convictions for drug offenses so they can have a clean start. When the government is no longer sending so many black men to prison for drugs, rates of other categories of black crime will probably go down. As fathers become available to provide guidance and support to their kids on a daily basis, rather than whenever the kids can come visit them in the prison visiting room. It's in the interest of all races that we work to strengthen black families, whether by ending the drug war or by fighting against the feminists, whose policies are in large part responsible for the trend. Since the 1960s, for black women to marry later in life, to be less likely to marry at all, and to have higher rates of marital instability. An example of how feminism adversely affects black-led families may be seen in the O.J. Simpson murder case. Simpson was merely trying to use a reasonable amount of force to correct his wife's behavior, but the police intervened to stop him in response to her 911 calls, prohibited in this manner from keeping discipline and order in his family. Simpson had to resort to the use of a blade to end his marriage 
in a way that wouldn't leave him vulnerable to losing half his property and custody of his kids in divorce proceedings. In this way, Simpson protected his kids from having to be exposed to their mother's immoral behavior and taught them by example how men have a right to respond to wives who are fragrantly disrespecting or otherwise displeasing them or having generally become more of a liability than an asset to have around. The black community, knowing he did nothing wrong, got behind him, and the jury set him free. But he should never have been subjected to being locked up for a year and put on trial, because his wife deserved what she got as retribution for her infidelity. In one of the 911 tapes, Simpson can be heard saying, you did not give a shit about the kids when you were sucking his dick in the living room. And his wife seems to admit to the 911 operator that she was in fact guilty of adultery. Given how much the authority of husbands has been undermined by feminists, it's understandable that black men would not even bother getting married anymore. Chris Brown, for example, was able to avoid the inconvenience of having to kill Rihanna because he could break up with her without her being able to subject him to a humiliating divorce process if they remained alive. He did, at times, find it necessary to make threats or use physical force against her, but that actually increases his popularity among female fans, who were impressed by his willingness to do what was necessary to keep his woman in line. But, from the perspective of wanting to keep any particular race from dying out, the decline of marriage as a social institution that many people are willing to participate in has a downside which is that it's correlated with a decline in fertility. The other politicians in this election, by the way, seem to be totally overlooking the fact that legalizing cannabis can reduce opioid addiction rates. When safer highs become available, people will tend to prefer those over the more dangerous ones. Once the government stops banning every new recreational drug that chemists come up with, then there will be market incentives to come up with new and safer drugs. Both police and prosecutors will often tell disgruntled members of the public, I don't make the laws, I just enforce them, and claim that they want to kick open people's doors in the middle of the night to search for drugs, or ask judges to throw the book at defendants that are simply doing their jobs. Yet every time a drug legalization proposal comes from a legislative panel, the leaders of the police associations and the prosecutors are there to testify against it. They can't have it both ways. They need to either be a truly neutral body of enforcers or admit to being a special interest group seeking to line their own pockets and gain more power at the expense of taxpayers and the families of victimless offenders who have to lose their loved ones to prison for no reason. The Washington Post reports that under asset forfeiture laws, the police take more cash and other property from people than burglars do. Part of draining the swamp is standing up to the cops and prosecutors who will fight against almost every effort to restore liberty to the people. Protecting Gun Ownership Rights All guns, including the M2 Browning, should be legalized for manufacture, distribution, and possession by private citizens and businesses, and subject to no more regulation than are applied to other potentially dangerous tools, such as buzz saws or bottles of muriatic acid. In other words, the fact that you can walk into a gun show and walk out with a gun 10 minutes later without having to go through a background check should be considered a feature, not a bug. The black thugs who want to shoot up urban neighborhoods with high-powered assault rifles are usually not going to show up to a gun show anyway, because those events are typically crawling with cops who might recognize them from wanted posters. Dan Helmer didn't have any warrants outstanding so he didn't mind demonstrating how easy it was to obtain a firearm from one of those venues. There have been a lot of calls to ban assault rifles after several school shootings, including the Stoneman Douglas High School shooting, were carried out using AR-15s. The distinguishing characteristics of an assault rifle are that it uses an intermediate cartridge and a detachable magazine. Attacks can be carried out with weapons other than guns, though. The Boston Marathon bombing in the Toronto van attack, for instance, did not involve guns, and three of the six people killed by St. Elliot were stabbed, rather than shot to death. As technology improves, it may become possible, anyway, to evade gun bans by manufacturing 3D-printed assault rifles at home. There have also been calls to raise the minimum age for buying firearms to 21. For as long as guns have existed, though, young people have had access to them, and we did not see as many mass shootings as we have seen today. This suggests that gun availability is not the direct cause of gun violence. In reality, it's feminists and psychiatrists who are causing the school shootings. 
many boys end up fatherless because feminists encouraged female sexual promiscuity and undermined husbands' authority over their wives. Feminists encourage young women to go to college and get a career rather than getting married and starting a family as soon as they become sexually mature. The failed relationships they have while putting off marriage harm their ability to pair bond, making it more than likely that when they finally do get married, that relationship will fail as well. In many marriages, the husband and wife bicker constantly because he lacks the power to use his pimp hand to put in her place. <laughs> what the fuck? Because he lacks the power to use his pimp hand to put her in her place. Where did that even come from? If they don't fight, it's often because the husband has given into her domineering ways and retreated back to his man cave to disengage from the conflict. Since the modern career woman has her own money and ample opportunities to cheat on her husband by claiming that she needs to stay late for work, and then go to yoga class, she ends up eventually leaving him. Since growing up without a dad is stressful for boys, they end up going on psychiatric drugs that cause them to become actively suicidal and violently aggressive. They then shoot up schools. Guns don't kill people, feminists do. The way to prevent school shootings is to reinstitute patriarchal rule in American families and stop putting kids on dangerous psychiatric drugs. Another way in which traditional sex roles could keep children safer, by the way, is that if more women become housewives who homeschool their kids, then those kids will not be around to get shot up when there's a school shooting. Another way in which guns save lives is that they give terrorists a way to kill people without using bombs. Timothy McVeigh, for example, said that if he read the novel Unintended Consequences, in which the protagonist carries out an assassination campaign against government officials years earlier, he might have shot Janet Reno in the head instead of carrying out the Oklahoma City bombing. In this way, the lives of 19 children could have been spared. We should get rid of laws like 18 USC, that ban felons from having firearms. The stop and frisk policies are aimed at catching black convicted felons who carry guns, so they can be sent back to prison for up to 10 years for the victimless offense of being a felon in possession of a firearm. Of course, part of the reason there are so many black convicted felons carrying firearms is that they are often involved in the drug trade. They can't just open a store and accept credit card payments the way a legal business would, but rather have to use weapons to defend their turf and their cash. Another reason black convicted felons would want to carry firearms is that there is a lot of black on black crime in certain neighborhoods which they want to protect themselves from. A lot of these neighborhoods have inept police departments that don't do a good job of responding to 911 calls, as we saw in cases like Warren v. District of Columbia. Just because someone has been involved in a crime doesn't mean that they should lose their right to defend themselves and their families. I'm for abolishing federal probation and supervised release of all other post-incarceration restrictions on liberty. Since I agree with what Joshua Jeb wrote concerning ticket of leave holders, that to impose conditions and restrictions that would effectively stamp them as individuals belonging to a criminal class in this country would be manifestly a most inexpedient exercise of power, and one that would be calculated to defeat the entire object of an approved system of convict discipline. To impose police supervision over a poor wretch struggling to find employment is the way to add to his difficulties and throw him back into crime instead of keeping him out of it. Convicts who are too dangerous to ever be allowed gun rights after being released from prison should probably simply be euthanized. 18 USC also bans men from possessing guns if they are subject to an intimate partner restraining order. That provision needs to be abolished, since it treats men who have not even been convicted of a crime as though they were criminals. More generally, I think we should get rid of every provision in federal law, such as 18 USC, requiring each state to enforce domestic violence restraining orders issued by other states, calling for restrictions to be placed on men subject to restraining orders, since these orders are typically used by by women as a shortcut to getting a de facto divorce rather than because the order is actually justified. A lot of restraining orders are for, quote, harassment rather than any other kind of physical abuse. Anyway, if women are actually as strong and independent as feminists claim, they would be able to just ignore men who try to bother them rather than relying on the state to keep those men away. There is also a provision in 18 U.S.C. banning men who have been convicted of a misdemeanor crime of domestic violence from owning guns. Physical discipline of wives shouldn't even be a crime anyway. 
but the idea of treating such misdemeanors as felonies was enough to make Justice Clarence Thomas break his silence for the first time in 10 years. In the case of Voisin v. United States, to ask, can you give me another area where a misdemeanor suspends a constitutional right, you're saying that recklessness is sufficient to trigger a violation. Misdemeanor violation of domestic conduct that results in a lifetime ban on possession of a gun, which, at least as of now, is still a constitutional right. Can you think of another constitutional right that can be suspended based upon a misdemeanor violation of a state law? We have to keep in mind that the nature of relations between the sexes are that men and women can never have a truly equal partnership. One will have to be dominant and the other submissive, or else the marriage will split apart, or the situation will devolve into chaos. John Locke's view was, But the husband and wife, though they have but one common concern, yet having different understandings, will unavoidably sometimes have different wills too. It therefore, being necessary, that the last determination, i.e. the rule, should be placed somewhere. It naturally falls to the man's share, as the abler and the stronger. Christie Zero Misty notes, I always find it funny when I see a marriage where the wife will brag that they're friends. They're really good friends, she'll say. We don't have the typical marriage. We're best buddies. He's not this overbearing chauvinistic pig, and I'm not a feminist brat. We get along great. Usually, I look over and the guy's sitting there looking whipped. The woman's saying, we have an equal relationship. What she means is, I'm in charge. She doesn't realize it, but to her, her being in charge makes it equal. It just happens that female dominance is less obvious sometimes than the brute force that men might use to keep control. Because women can get their way by essentially using the kids as hostages, threatening to deprive them of the benefit of being raised by their biological parents together, unless the husband submits to her will. Of course, what she's threatening to do wasn't what she agreed upon at the outset of the marriage, but the state will throw such agreements out the window for the sake of giving her autonomy and for what it deems the best interests of the child. All feminism will do is change the order of the socio-sexual hierarchy to place women above betas. Alphas will remain at the top and gammas, aka cucks, and omegas, aka incels, will remain at the bottom. It is similar to how another egalitarian system, communism, did not produce equality either. It only elevated the politburo, the commissars, etc., above the sars and capitalists who had been in charge. One class of leaders replaced another, but human relations remained hierarchical. Under communism, though, the peasants at the bottom were not able to vote with their ballots for good political leaders and get the same effect as when they had voted with their money for good business leaders. Therefore, the economy could not produce enough food to sustain the population. Much as under feminism, families cannot produce enough children to sustain the population. The quality of the goods produced under communism was also less than what it was under capitalism. Much as the quality of the children produced under feminism tends to diminish over time, rather than increasing, as it would under patriarchy. The reason is that under feminism, as under communism, the high-quality men at the bottom tend to lack upward mobility by which they might rise to a position of more power, whether to have more wives, as would be the case under patriarchy, or to be in charge of producing goods, as would be the case under capitalism. And by high-quality men, I don't mean Alex from Target, who became a sensation because of his looks. I mean men who are able to financially support a large family. Feminism also deprives attractive women of a lot of their upward mobility by hindering women from a lower economic class from rising above their stations by marrying a wealthy man. A 17-year-old girl like Debbie Wesson Gibson, for example, will not be able to marry a high-status older man like Roy Moore, even if her mother considers her the luckiest girl in the world. The natural order is that, because women are the reproductive bottleneck, since they must expend more biological resources to produce children than men do, our species has evolved so that men are the ones with a wider range of ability, while women are clustered more in the middle of the distribution. The purpose of a woman in a patriarchal society is to be reliable, conformist to what is expected of them, and to be judged primarily based on their beauty and cooperativeness, i.e. their averageness, and only secondarily on the basis of intelligence. Men, on the other hand, are to be judged primarily based on their ability to excel beyond the average in what they do and to be leaders rather than followers, with such factors as handsomeness, charm, and so on being a secondary importance, since they serve as imperfect indicators of his potential compared to what he has actually been able to achieve. 
The idea is that a wealthy, dominant man with fertile, submissive women will be able to produce a large number of offspring, some of whom will have a combination of traits for high fitness. The rest can be cold. Polygyny and male dominance produce good outcomes because, as Walter Block put it, women are God's or nature's insurance policy and men are his crapshoot. And in the crapshoot, some men get very, very good genes and other men get very bad genes and end up in a bad way. Under patriarchy, women who tend to be mediocre compared to men in areas that are outside the female specialities of childcare, homemaking, and so on, accept leadership from those men whom they can look up to, and the other men are weeded out of the population. Because the natural order is that women are paired with men who are better leaders than themselves, it works better if women take on a submissive role in those relationships rather than vying for equal power. Equality requires fences between equals. But in the marital relationship, there are no fences, so therefore there can be no equality. There must be a chain of command to administer the shared household. Feminism and communism don't produce prosperity and happiness. On the contrary, they swell the ranks of the classes of sexual and material have-nots, respectively. Nor do they produce greater freedom. Much as it is in the nature of the average worker to need to serve some boss or another, it is in the nature of the average woman to need to serve some man or another. If there is no man at the top of whatever organization a woman works for, there will be a masculinized woman at the top, who is still taking her leadership cues from some man or another. That never changes. Even Hillary Clinton's rise to the Democratic presidential nomination was preceded by her husbands, who paved the way for her. And female politicians like Maggie Thatcher and Angela Merkel had men around them to advise them on what to do. They're not like Adolf Hitler, who came up with his own theories and implemented them. They're not creative geniuses of the same caliber. Benevolent white supremacy. It has been alleged by many press outlets that I threatened to kill Barack Obama, the implication being that of my racism. I oppose the elevation of Obama to the presidency. Like every other human being, I am indeed racist. I did not specifically threaten Obama, nor was my threat motivated by racism. My forensic evaluation notes. Mr. Larson allegedly sent an email to the Secret Service on December 11, 2008, in which he claimed he would kill the President of the United States in the near future. The email stated his primary motivation was that the President is the leader of the largest and most dangerous criminal organization in the world, namely the United States government. The email contained a polemic against the legitimacy of the government and advocated libertarian principles. Several books advocating these principles were recommended in the email. The government is interested in prosecuting hate crimes, so if there had been any indication of a racist motive or of my having a history of racism, they would have mentioned it in the evaluation or in my present tense investigation report. I don't even consider Barack Obama the first black president. He is, rather, the first mulatto president or the first Oreo president. He was born to and raised by a white woman, Ann Dunham. His black father was absent during most of his upbringing. White America felt comfortable voting for him because he looked black enough that he would enable them to check the box of having elected a black president, and thereby assuage their white guilt by proving that they aren't racist. He was white enough that he could be trusted not to do serious damage to the country. Whites looked at Obama's law career and listened to his comments on race including his response to the Jeremiah Wright controversy, concluded, he's one of us, and cast their votes for that historic ticket. But whites still have enough racial awareness that they would never elect a full-blooded black man to the highest office in the land. What did happen, though, was while I was behind bars, I got a glimpse of a racially political society where, unlike in the outside world, the interracial struggle for dominance is more overt. At Inglewood, Federal Detention Center, the prison population was about one-third Latino, one-third Black, and one-third White, with a few Native Americans and Asians sprinkled in. For the most part, there was harmony among the races, as in the outside world, commerce brought the races together for their mutual benefit. For example, my cellmate and I set up a business in which we sold legal services to the Blacks, filing petitions with the courts on their behalf to get their crack cocaine trafficking sentences reduced. The blacks, in turn, had their own businesses, 
in which they would iron jumpsuits to help prisoners look presentable for visits. Or, if they were artistic, they would create and sell Mother's Day or Valentine's Day cards for prisoners to send home to the women in their lives who were taking care of their kids, putting commissary money on their books, and helping smuggle drugs into the prison. Where problems arose were when non-whites got into a situation where they could lord it over whites. There were three TV rooms in our unit, and when I first got there, each of the three major races, Latino, white, and black, occupied one of them. That way, each TV could be devoted to programming in the language spoken by the race in question, Spanish, English, Ebonics, respectively. Then one day I noticed the Latinos were still occupying their TV room, but now the blacks were using both of the two remaining TV rooms. I asked one of the whites what had happened, and he said the blacks had just arbitrarily gone in there and changed the channel from what the whites were watching, and taken over the TV room, so that they could watch two different black channels at the same time, rather than only one. I asked why they were being allowed to get away with that, and he said, we don't want to get into a race war over a TV. Another white prisoner explained the mentalities of the races. That's the big difference between us and them. When we run the prison, we make sure that the blacks have a TV to watch. It might be the most raggedy and beat up TV in the unit, but we won't leave them without a TV. But when they run the prison, they take all the TVs and leave us with nothing. Essentially, what had happened was that the white prisoners had lost their will to rule, and degenerated from convicts to cuckfics. And once the blacks saw that we wouldn't fight back, acts of petty black tyrants became a daily annoyance. We would be standing in line for chow and the black serving the chicken would pick up a piece, notice that the prisoner standing in front of them was white, and then would put that piece down and give him a smaller piece, so that he could give the larger piece to one of his fellow blacks. On Thanksgiving, I asked one of the whites what happened to all the turkey breast meat. It turned out one of the blacks in the kitchen had stolen all of it and loaded it into garbage bags to be smuggled out of the dining hall by his mules so that it could be sold on the compound. So we had to do without, unless we wanted to buy back what had been on the official menu, but then snatched. The same kind of pattern has played out on a larger scale, and to a more extreme extent, in many parts of the world. In Haiti, when the Frenchmen lost their will to rule, they got slaughtered by the black plantation workers. In Rhodesia, after whites lost their will to fight against the Russian and Chinese-backed communistic blacks, the country became Zimbabwe, and the white farmers were evicted from their land. Governing a modern first world country and global economic and cultural hub like the United States requires upholding certain values, such as liberty and the rule of law, and being fair to all inhabitants, including those of other races. This is not like the days of the Roman Empire or the Confederate State of America, when it made economic sense to have a large class of slaves. That is what attracts immigrants to this country. They get tired of the corrupt police, the bought-off courts, and the oppressive rulers of their own people, and come here to be ruled more benevolently by whites. It's not entirely our system of government or our culture that make America different from other countries. Many Latin American countries have modeled their constitutions after the U.S. Constitution, but devolved into corrupt dictatorships. The Philippines were ruled by America and adopted not only a similar constitution, but also the English language and many aspects of American culture. But the Philippines have not been able to become a first world country like Japan or South Korea or the European Union or the United States. The reason is that the Filipinos are racially different from their East Asian neighbors and from European and American whites. They are not as highly evolved, and none of Rodrigo Duarte's bluster can change that. He's adopting the same provocative style as Donald Trump, and it will not transform the Philippines into the United States. The Filipinos, like the Israelis, cannot escape from their dependency on foreign military support to secure their country's, quote, independence in a world full of powerful enemies who would like to take what they have. The Filipinos know that, since their country has done everything it could to copy Western ways and still hasn't risen to first world status, their only remaining hope is to improve their stock with some white genetics. Therefore, they are eager to open their legs to the white tourists to their country, in hopes of having lighter-skinned babies with some white intellectual and personality traits. These can perhaps finally be the leaders who will bring their families and their country to greatness. What makes whites, or at least the more highly evolved whites, different from other races is our cultural creativeness, our willingness to invest in the long term rather than living for today and our conscious desire to do the right thing even when it requires heroic self-sacrifice for the good of society.
The only problem is that this can be exploited if others are able to deceive us into falsely believing ourselves to be iniquitous. They can get us to behave in racially suicidal ways if they can trick us into thinking that doing so would serve the interests of fairness and benefit society. Jews have proven particularly adept at this kind of deception, although what tends to happen is that whites eventually realize what's going on and get rid of them. This is why whenever it seems that the goyim know, the Jews shut it down. For example, whites will mistakenly believe that blacks will benefit from being given an equal voice in running the government. That is not true. What will actually benefit blacks is if whites use their position of power to maintain and enhance the infrastructure to keep society running and more generally build an advanced civilization that blacks can join us in reaping the benefits of. Blacks, if given power, will not know what to do with it. If they are capable of running a first world country, then Africa would not be in the state it's in, and Africans would not be climbing aboard inflatable boats to risk their lives trying to migrate across the Mediterranean Sea to Europe. American blacks are aware of these racial realities, which is why they defer to the white and Jewish leaders of the Democratic Party, even though, like everyone else, they go through the motions of repeating politically correct orthodoxy that everyone is equal. Although blacks will sometimes test whites by seeing how they react to being chided over 19th century Negro slavery or questioned about racism, that is mostly for their own amusement rather than because they seriously feel aggrieved. Libertarianism represented a higher phase of development of the white man's thinking about politics than what had come before. Neo-reaction is a further refinement of those ideas to correct certain errors that had crept in over the years due to the influence of egalitarianism. Libertarian economic theory explained the benefits of interracial cooperation by showing how comparative advantage can be leveraged to grow the economy. Neo-reaction brings the same elements of classical libertarianism by recognizing the value of hierarchy and enabling smooth relations between between the sexes, the races, and the other disparate groups, and of preserving the freedom of homogenous groups to erect walls within which they could retreat to and enjoy the companionship of a homogeneous group, when they are not out in larger society interacting with a more heterogeneous group. Although to some extent, the family today mostly remains the fundamental unit of society, within limited sanctity of the home the state allows to exist. Modern society has lost sight of the importance of the extended family, aka the tribe. Joseph Smith, white supremacist hero. Joseph Smith was the leader of perhaps the greatest religion the world had ever seen, Mormonism. This religion spread rapidly, both through proselytization and childbearing, as the church encouraged women to marry at a young age and have lots of kids. The men were allowed to have multiple wives, thus enabling the best familial genes and culture to be propagated more rapidly. The church was white supremacist, banning blacks from the priesthood and other leadership roles until 1978, when the church yielded to pressure to change the policy. In 1844, Joseph Smith announced his campaign for the presidency of the United States. His platform proposed to, among other things, gradually end slavery through compensated emancipation and reduce the size of Congress to allow Texas, California, and Oregon to join the Union, to reform prisons, and to authorize the federal government to protect the liberties of Mormons and other minorities. Smith sent out Mormon missionary electioneers to share the gospel and Smith's political message. The Mormons had reached a point at which they could affect the outcome of elections by voting en masse for the candidates chosen by the church leadership, and Smith had also raised a large army, the Novu Legion. He was getting powerful enough that people were beginning to fear he could take control of the country. Regrettably, Smith's campaign was cut short by his assassination on the 27th of June, 1844. Still, the Mormon church has had a good run, building successful charities which often promoted self-reliance and resisting, until 1890, the legal and social pressures to give up on polygyny. The Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints which has even more of a coolness factor than the regular LDS, their style of dress actually got more conservative as time went on, held out longer. But in the end, it too succumbed to persecution that was greater than it could withstand. Mormons fashionistas have promoted the idea that modest is hottest, and Mormon songwriters have published natalist children's music like I Want to Be a Mother, whose lyrics go, When I grow up, I want to be a mother, and have a family. One little, two little, three little babies of my own. Of all the jobs for me, I'll choose no other. I'll have a family, four little, five little, six little babies in my home. And I will love them all day long and give them cookies and milk and yellow balloons and cuddle them when things go wrong and read them stories and sing them pretty tunes. When I grow up, if I can be a mother, how happy I will be. 
one little, two little, three little babies I can love. And you will say, each sister and each brother all look a lot like me. Four little, five little, six little blessings from above. Mormon inventors include pioneers William Clayton and Appleton Milo Harmon, inventor of the rotometer, Jonathan Browning, improved firearms, Philo T. Farnsworth, the electric television, Alvin McBurney, pedal steel guitars, William Devries, artificial transplant surgery, Lester Wire, the electric traffic light, Thomas Stockham, digital sound, Harvey Fletcher, the hearing aid, Howard Tracy Hall, artificial diamonds, John Aldous Dixon, lasers and surgery, Wayne Quinton, the kidney dialysis shunt, and the lightweight treadmill, Robert W. Gore, Gore-Tex waterproof fabric, and Homer R. Warner, medical informatics, the LDS, humanitarian services, which provides emergency response supplies, wheelchairs, clean water, neonatal resuscitation, and blindness prevention services to third world countries, is an example of how white-led movements benefit non-whites. Adolf Hitler, white supremacist hero. Adolf Hitler dedicated his life to German Volk. One of his major early accomplishments was writing Mein Kampf, the story of his struggle against lies, stupidity, and cowardice during his childhood, his sojourn as an architecture student in Austria, his service as a volunteer soldier in World War I, in the early years of National Socialist struggle leading up to the Beer Hall Putsch. It is an autobiography, political treatise, and guide to activism, all rolled into one book. Contrary to myth, the American black newspapers reported that during the 1936 Summer Olympics, Adolf Hitler treated black athlete Jesse Owens quite well. Owens reported it was not Hitler who snubbed him after he won a medal, but Franklin Roosevelt. Hitler went to war against Poland because he was unwilling to let Germany get cucked out of its territory in Danzig, in the Polish Corridor. He wanted to end the persecution of the German people who had been scattered abroad and bring them under the protection of the Third Reich. Hitler knew that the German people needed Lebensraum if they were to reach their full potential. It was the German Volk who had culturally developed Danzig in the Corridor, lifting them up from the depths of barbarism, and Poland's only claim to that land was that Poland had been able to take it by force. Therefore, if Germany could take it back and keep it by force, then Germany's claim would have higher legitimacy than Poland's. Although the French and English claimed they were declaring war on Germany out of a desire to preserve Poland's territorial integrity, they did not declare war on the Soviets, who had also invaded Poland, and who massacred the Polish intelligentsia at Caden. After the Battle of Dunkirk, as a show of good faith and over the objections of his own generals, Hitler allowed the trapped Allied forces to escape untouched. Hitler hoped that this gracious act would make the British more willing to make peace, but it was not to be. His 19 July 1940 last appeal to reason, in which he warned that the war would destroy the British Empire, was rebuffed. When the Soviets betrayed Germany by liquidating Northeast Europe, including Finland and the Baltics, and preparing for an attack on Germany, Hitler was forced to go to war against them as well. Because of the broad appeal of Hitler's white supremacist message, there were many volunteers who were non-Germans in the German armed forces during World War II, often motivated by a desire for the freedom of their nations against Soviet domination or British imperialism. A number of Slovakian, Muslim, Dutch, Flemish, Ukrainian, Ukrainian, Swedish, French, and Russian men were among those who joined Hitler's forces. Hitler pointed out the hypocrisy in how the British complained about German expansion into Central and Eastern Europe, yet still ruled over Palestine, Arabia, Egypt, and India. Many Indian business students still read Mein Kampf because they regard Hitler as a management guru. A bookstore owner in New Delhi explains, We like Hitler because he was a Hindu. He was a vegetarian, and he used the swastika as a symbol for good luck. He was one of us. Some might argue Hitler destroyed Germany by starting a war he couldn't win, but Hitler's view was that quiet acquiescence to enslavement would have been worse for Germany, in the long run, than defeat on the battlefield. To accept what was being done to Germany without a fight would have led only to further humiliations. In Mein Kampf, Hitler notes that this had already been proven by events that transpired after World War I. After we had laid down our arms in November 1918, policy was adopted which in all human probability was bound to lead gradually to our complete subjugation. Analogous examples from history show that those nations which lay down their arms without being absolutely forced to do so subsequently prefer to submit to the greatest humiliations and exactions rather than try to change their fate by resorting to arms again. That is intelligible on purely human grounds. A shrewd conqueror will always enforce his exactions on the conquered only by stages as far as that is possible. Then he may expect that the people who have lost all strength of character, which is always the case with every nation that voluntarily submits to threats of an opponent, will not find any of these acts of oppression, if one be enforced 
apart from the other, sufficient grounds for taking up arms again. The more numerous the extortions, thus passively accepted, so much the less will resistance appear justified in the eyes of other people. If the vanquished nation should end by revolting against the last act of oppression in a long series, and that is especially if the nation has already patiently and silently accepted impositions which were much more exacting. The fall of Carthage is a terrible example of the slow agony of a people which ended in destruction and which was the fault of the people themselves. In his three articles of faith, Clausewitz expressed this idea admirably and gave it a definite form when he said, The stigma of shame incurred by a cowardly submission can never be effaced. The drop of poison which thus enters the blood of a nation will be transmitted to posterity. It will undermine and paralyze the strength of later generations. But on the contrary, he added, even the loss of its liberty after a sanguinary and honorable struggle assures the resurgence of the nation and is the vital nucleus from which one day a new tree can draw firm roots. After World War II, Germany was able to rebuild and become once again the most prosperous and mighty nation in Europe ranked number 5 globally by gross domestic product and number 10 in global firepower. Even though they lost the Second World War, they made their point that Germany would not accept subjugation by those who wanted to bleed their country dry. Some might argue that Hitler was not a libertarian. This is true, but Hitler probably would have adopted libertarianism if he had thought it would serve the nation's purposes. Yeah, sure, bro. As he said in response to objections to the abolition of interest servitude, any idea may be a source of danger if it be looked upon as an end in itself, when really, it is only the means to an end. For me, and for all genuine national socialists, there's only one doctrine, people and fatherland. His reason for focusing so much on race was that, quote, ideals do not exist of themselves somewhere in the air, but are the product of man's creative imagination and disappear when he disappears. Nature knows nothing of them. Moreover, they are characteristic of only a small number of nations, or rather of races, and their value depends on the measure in which they spring from the racial feeling of the latter. Humane and aesthetic ideals will disappear from the inhabited earth when those races disappear, which are the creators and standard bearers of them. We see the truth of this when we look at, say, the result of the 2016 presidential election. Gary Johnson got his highest percentage of votes in states with a large preponderance of whites. Whites, since the inception of their kind, have intended to be the most libertarian race. John Locke was pretty white, and so was Thomas Jefferson. Admittedly, a lot of libertarian thinkers, such as Ludwig von Mises, Murray Rothbard, Walter Bloch, etc. were Jewish, but they have had to spend most of their careers countering egalitarian ideologies such as Marxism and feminism that were put forth by Jews who were less friendly to libertarianism. Hitler did have some libertarian sentiments, but his view was that the first step was to acquire power with which to protect values such as liberty. A strong national Reich, which recognizes and protects, to the largest possible measure, the rights of its citizens both within and outside its frontiers, can allow the freedom to reign at home without trembling for the safety of the state. Also, the more completely our ideas triumph, the more liberty we can concede, in particular affairs, to our citizens at home. More generally, human rights are above the rights of the state. But if a people be defeated in the struggle for its human rights, this means that its weight has proved too light in the scale of destiny to have the luck of being able to endure in the terrestrial world. The world is not there to be possessed by the faint-hearted races, he notes. The old Reich gave freedom to its people at home and showed itself strong towards the outside world, whereas the Republic shows itself weak towards the stranger and oppresses its own citizens at home. In both cases, one attitude determines the other. A vigorous national state does not need to make many laws for the interior because of the affection and attachment of its own citizens. The international servile state can live only by coercing its citizens to render it the services it demands. He observes, state enterprise nearly always lags behind private enterprise. Of these gentry, one can truly say that their maxim is, what we don't know won't bother us. And he writes that, experience has shown that the productive powers of the individual are more enhanced by being accorded a generous measure of freedom than by coercion from above. Moreover, by according this freedom, we give free play to the natural process of selection which brings forward the ablest and most capable and most industrious. He understood how competitive pressures could promote the best businessmen to positions of leadership in industry. Only those should rule who have the natural temperament and gifts of leadership, such as men of brains and selected mainly, as I have already said, through the hard struggle for existence itself. 
In this struggle, there are many who break down and collapse and thereby show that they are not called by destiny to fill the highest positions, and only very few are left who can be classed among the elect. In the realm of thought and artistic creation, and even in the economic field, the same process of selection takes place, although, especially in the economic field, its operation is heavily handicapped. Now, perhaps Hitler should have simply pressed the button on the rostrum to abolish the state and set the market free to protect the German people, since private defense agencies could have emerged through spontaneous order. But it's not like anarcho-capitalist theory was a thing back then that he would have been aware of. George Lincoln Rockwell, uncomfortable with the idea of socialism since it was associated with communism and Marxism, originally called the American Nazi Party with World Union a free enterprise national socialist. He explains, We believe in private property and free enterprise. It is impossible, we believe, to have a society in which there is any real work going on unless people can get the reward of their effort. Private Borders, the Mexico-United States Barrier Part of me wants to say that a Mexico-United States barrier isn't a good idea, because it commits us to a somewhat nationalized immigration policy rather than a more decentralized policy. But there's the fact that physical border controls aren't always that effective. The desert already serves as a border control, but people still risk their lives to come here through the desert. On the other hand, the wall might not actually be all that expensive compared to a lot of other stuff the federal government invests in, and there might be some benefit in keeping some of the worst elements on the other side of the border, assuming the federal government would actually come up with a reasonable list of immigration criteria as opposed to excluding communists, Nazis, polygamists, etc. I don't like communists either, but Hitler scoffed at such exclusions, saying, It required of him that his political attitude is not such as to give cause for uneasiness. In other words, he must be a harmless simpleton in politics. So anyway, let's suppose we're going to have a border wall. Trump brings up the fact that if the Israelis can build a 440-mile-long barrier, we can surely build a 1,954-mile-long Mexico-United States barrier, if we want to. It's not an unsurmountable engineering challenge for a nation that has the technology and know-how to build skyscrapers. That is true. But there's a reason why the government is not put in charge of building skyscrapers, but rather leaves the task to the private sector. Anything the government tries to build will tend to be ugly, take forever to build, and run over budget. Our transportation system is proof of that. If we're going to build a wall, then probably the most efficient way to do it is to contract the work out to Donald Trump himself to build. Congress, or some private organization, if it's going to be funded through donations, can look over the building contract, make sure that the price and specifications are acceptable, and sign off on it. If Trump is the builder, and he ends up ripping off the wall's funders by building a substandard wall, then he can be sued for breach of contract, and or the voters can punish him in the United States presidential election, 2020. Choosing Trump to build it then, while seeming to be possible conflict of interest, could actually introduce a check and balance to the arrangement, since he would not be able to blame any deficiencies in the wall on some other company that's not owned by him. The builder needs to be a company that has a concern for its brand and reputation being on the line. And given that Trump loves bragging about his accomplishments and would want a wall that's going to bring glory to him as the builder whenever it's in the news, that could be a reason to pick him to build the wall. As Ayn Rand wrote, a man's ego is the fountainhead of human progress. Sometimes it seems like if Trump can't find a way to cut through all the red tape involved in trying to get anything accomplished in Washington and build the wall himself and take credit for it, the way he did this with hotels and casinos and so on, he's going to be content with saying the wall was just a metaphor. Legal Immigrants The populist economic arguments raised by Shaq Hill for why we should get rid of illegal immigrants don't hold any water. Some of the same points Henry Hazlitt made in The Curse of Machinery about how automation benefits the consumer without increasing the unemployment rate also apply to immigrants. When we're able to be more productive with the help of low-wage immigrants, who handle our menial tasks for us, then our real wages rise because we can buy more without doing any more work than we were doing. The larger a population is, the more scope there is for specialization and division of labor, creating a wider variety of jobs. It also becomes more cost-effective to invest in automation for mass production. Many 10th Congressional District residents have told me, I don't want Syrian immigrants living next door to me, 25 people to a house. Or, I don't want Mexican immigrants who don't have health insurance clogging up the emergency rooms. The solution to that is to simply ban Syrian immigrants, or Mexican immigrants, or whatever class of immigrants one wants to ban, from communities that don't want them. 
some other community can take them and perhaps charge higher property taxes to make up for the fact that the residents are consuming more local services per household. Another possibility, already implemented to some extent in family-based immigration law, is that immigrants' sponsors can be required to sign an affidavit of support, holding them liable for the cost of any state services that immigrants use. There already is some political support for sanctuary cities that illegal immigrants can flee to, so they can avoid getting deported. It seems fair, then, to allow for whites to establish white sanctuary cities where they can be free of unwanted immigrants or other groups they prefer not to have as neighbors. We should repeal all equal housing opportunity, equal employment opportunity, and other civil rights legislation that prohibits discrimination by private property owners. If someone wants to set up, say, a white-only apartment complex, that should be his prerogative. In this sense, we can have some private borders and stop, say, Mexican immigrants from entering places where they're unwelcome without denying Americans who want to do business with immigrants the right to do so. Even though people living 25 to a house can be a nuisance to the locals, it enables those workers to keep their costs low and thereby charge a low rate for their labor. So communities in need of cheap labor might see fit to make accommodations for them to be around. This isn't really a problem, as long as the costs of having those immigrants around are absorbed by the community that harbors them rather than becoming an externality. This is somewhat similar to what Corey Stewart was trying to do in Prince William County. He wanted to make it a refuge where whites who were tired of dealing with illegal immigrants and their alien culture and the drain they were putting on local social services could find peace and comfort and feel at home. And although the leftists criticize him as a racist, he has continued to be re-elected because this is what his white constituents want. They are tired of having to put up with the stifling norms of political correctness, which force them to pretend to be unaware of the hate facts about the Latinos who live amongst them. And although they may feel afraid to speak out openly, they are happy to cast a vote for Stewart in the privacy of the voting booth. The leftists also said Stewart had no chance of getting very many votes in the 2017 gubernatorial primary after he defended Confederate flag waivers, but he proved them wrong, much like how Trump proved the mainstream media pundits wrong in 2016. These same dynamics come into play during ballot access petitioning. A few people will say, I'm fine with the choices I have, and not want to help an unknown like me get on the ballot. But the majority will sign just because they want a chance to hear what someone outside the mainstream will have to say. They are looking for someone, anyone, who might be able to help lead this country out of the mess it's in. One woman told me, I would vote for King Kong over Barbara Comstock. A white-haired lady told me, I have a bad back, but I will do cartwheels the day that Barbara Comstock is voted out. Comstock, by the way, caught flack for putting forth a workable proposal that immigrants be tracked like FedEx packages. If we're going to have a visa system, then it makes sense to have it set up to track when immigrants enter or leave the country through border checkpoints, so that if they overstay their visas, a red flag will go up and immigration enforcement officers can begin looking for them, to apprehend and deport them. What leftists didn't like about her proposal was that she was thinking about the most logical way to accomplish the goals of American immigration policy which led her to make an apology that dehumanized immigrants by comparing them to cargo. Sometimes, clear thinking does require dehumanizing people to a certain extent, though by thinking of them in terms of their shared functions and characteristics. A government bureaucracy, in particular, tends to reduce people to units to be processed in a standardized way according to a system of rules. It's one of the reasons why it's better to minimize the scope of government activities and allow the free market to provide solutions tailored to the needs of each individual. The reality, in any event, is that the immigrants are not necessarily thinking primarily about how they can better make a contribution to the world by coming here to work in our economy, but often just want a better life for themselves and their families. Therefore, it's fair if we also look at the value they would contribute to the country rather than how their coming here would be of benefit to them. We have to look out for ourselves so we can continue to be in the position to have anything to offer others. If we let the country be overrun and taken over by those who would destroy its value, then there will be no reason for anyone to want to come here anymore, and we also will no longer have a decent place in which to live. Some might ask, why do we need non-whites in the country at all? We don't really need them, but the alternative to having them around would be to have a white proletariat class fulfill the same roles in the economy that non-whites fulfill. The mentality of some white ethnicities is similar to that of certain non-white races. For example, Slavic women in many ways are as scheming as Jewesses. They have often used their beauty and intellect to attract white men and then destroyed them. They, oh my god. They need to be kept on leashes just like any other woman to keep them out of mischief. 
The alt-right needs to keep in mind, by the way, that even if Donald Trump's immigration plan is implemented, it will only keep whites in the U.S. majority for an extra five years. The good news is that this may not be fatal to white America, because as Hitler points out, more often than once inferior races with Germanic organizers and rulers as their leaders become formidable states, and continued to exist as long as the racial nucleus remained, which had originally created each respective state. Whites can stay in control if they are willing to abandon the one-man, one-vote democratic system and go back to an aristocratic system that disenfranchises all but the best elements of society. As William Luther Pierce notes, part of the reason why our system is so susceptible to corruption is that it allows fools to vote and knaves to hold office. Neocameralism, or as libertarians might call it, anarcho-capitalism, is one system we might try. Trump would probably suggest that we just make him our benevolent monarch. But given that he's not a libertarian, I would prefer some other option. It's great to apply the Furens. Oh my god, what the fuck? What, what is that? Dude, I'm so sick of Hitler's bullshit. Alright, so this is another word I'm gonna butcher, but here we go. It's great to apply the Führerprinzip and have one leader who is accountable for everything the government does, but we need to have the right system in place for selecting that leader and ensuring the proper incentives are in place for him to make decisions that will serve the best interests of the people. By the way, I support La Colectiva's efforts to hold Alfonso H. Lopez accountable by seeking answers from him about the nature of his consulting work for ICA Farmville. Mass incarceration of Latinos is a problem at the federal level, too, with illegal re-entry to the country being punishable. Pursuant to 8 U.S.C. 1326, by 10 years in prison for those with prior felony convictions and 20 years for those with prior aggravated felony convictions. One might argue that some of these are bad hombres who should not be here, but the fact remains that illegal re-entry in and of itself is a victimless crime, or at any rate, a crime that directly causes minimal amount of damage. Also, there are so many victimless felony offenses, such as drug trafficking, on the books that a lot of these immigrants with criminal records are not actually people who committed aggression against anyone. Some might ask, if you think whites are superior, why do you care what happens to blacks or Latinos? It's because, even if some are subhuman, that's still no reason to arbitrarily act in a cruel way towards them. It's similar to how, if you have a pet dog, you should not abuse your power by leaving that dog chained up in the backyard in all kinds of bad weather with no shelter. That kind of behavior tends to tarnish one's reputation for being a good steward. Some alt-righters are more inclined to say, we should kill off all non-whites, or otherwise get rid of them, since we don't need them. It's probably true that we could survive without them. But there can be a benefit sometimes to keeping around animals to whom we are superior rather than driving them extinct. If non-whites ever become too obsolete and useless to be worth keeping around, then they would simply become unable to earn a living. The invisible hand of the market will destroy them. We don't need to actually go out of our way to make this happen sooner than it would happen naturally. One might argue, if non-whites can't defend themselves from being killed by whites, that is proof of their inferiority. But those whites who find non-whites useful would probably try to defend them from those whites who want to kill them. Taking property is different from taking a life. The former has an economic benefit for the aggressor, while the latter doesn't. People who have no property can still be useful as slaves, including as pets which are a type of slave. Typically, only those who prove unfit even to serve as slaves end up being annihilated entirely. There are degrees of slavery, by the way. Even American whites have always been enslaved to a certain degree, because their freedom has been restricted in ways the government deemed would make them better servants. For example, they were not given total freedom to dispose of their incomes as they saw fit. Some was taken away through taxation. The problem is feminism. Trump reportedly asked why we would bring in so many immigrants from shithole countries like Haiti rather than places like Norway. The problem is first world countries aren't producing a lot of children, so if Norwegians came here, they would only hasten Norway's own population collapse. Feminism is the global problem that, if left unchecked, will eventually destroy all races. It begins with the white race, calling the best and the brightest by encouraging the most intelligent women to attend university and start a career rather than reproducing before their biological clocks run out. Since women have a natural tendency to seek out a mate who is of higher status than themselves, high-status women often remain single because the men around them are lower status than them. But the feminist cancer is not contained 
only within the first world. It spreads to every country the feminists can gain access to. Under the guise of stopping, quote, human trafficking, State Department feminists like Alison Friedman fight to abolish other nations' traditional patriarchal practices, such as forced marriage. Yet, even Wikipedia notes that reasons for performing forced marriages include controlling unwanted behavior and sexuality, preventing unsuitable relationships, protecting and abiding by perceived cultural or religious norms, dealing with the consequences of pregnancy out of wedlock, and obtaining a guarantee against poverty. Far from being exploitative, forced marriage, or as we perhaps should call it, arranged marriage, furthers many worthy goals that are for the benefit of all. Even a Muslim society's birth rate will collapse when feminism is introduced. In Afghanistan, the Taliban did not allow girls to go to school and endorsed child marriage, or as we perhaps should call it, early marriage. After the Taliban fell and NATO countries began funding schooling and birth control for girls, the fertility rate dropped from 8 in the 1990s to 5.1 at the end of 2010, and is projected to drop below replacement by around 2050. USA Today reports, in developing nations where fertility rates begin to slide, the decline usually continues, according to global birth rate histories, a sign that Afghanistan's birth rate may be on permanent descent. Similarly, in the U.S., the fertility rate of Latinas is also in decline. Daniel Nering notes, second generation 15 to 44 years old had fewer children ever born than both first generation Hispanic women and third generation Hispanic women who are American born and had two native parents as well. One explanation for the lower fertility levels found specifically in second generation Hispanic women is the mediating effect of educational attainment and career opportunities. In other words, sending girls to school destroys populations. The feminists are public enemy number one, more dangerous to the white race than MS-13, radical Islamist terror, and Kim Jong-un's nuclear weapons program combined. There are signs that, as Hitler predicted, would happen when fertility rates were allowed to go into decline. The Flynn effect, in which a population's intelligence rises over time, has begun to reverse. Not only is feminism causing a numerical decline in our population, it is causing a decline in quality as well. Patriarchy. Congress should repeal the Violence Against Women Act and all other legislation that interferes with the patriarchal rule in the family. We need to switch to a system that classifies women as property, initially of their fathers and later of their husbands. Patriarchy is the only system known to man that can produce and nurture enough children to keep the fertility rate above the replacement rate and thereby perpetuate the species. It is, therefore, the only system of relations between men and women that is sustainable in the long run. The Institute for Family Studies notes, quick policy fixes, like more parental leave or financial incentives, may have some effect but are likely to be quite expensive relative to their modest impact on birth rates. We can't subsidize our way out of the problem, even if, as some feminists suggest, we fund a better social safety net so women can both work and have more children, i.e. tax sexless, childless men to pay for the support of the children fathered by the men whom women would rather reproduce with. It won't be enough. France tried that, and it didn't suffice. Even if career women have enough money to raise large families, they don't have enough time. Patriarchy is a eugenic system that promotes the improvement of cultural and genetic quality over time. In a patriarchal society, the most beautiful and intelligent girls are married off at a young age and used to produce and raise more children who have those same high-quality characteristics. They are not sent to a university to be educated or sent into the workforce to devote their years of peak beauty and fertility to tasks that men, who have a longer window of fertility and who devote fewer bodily resources to production, could be doing. In a patriarchal society, fathers pick their daughters' husbands, choosing based on their ability to provide rather than based on superficial qualities. This is also eugenic. Barbara Comstock, unless she's a cafeteria Catholic, must believe to some extent in traditional sex roles, since she belongs to a sexist religion, Roman Catholicism, that only allows men into the priesthood. Catholics also have a number of other beliefs that tend to grant husbands privileges, such as the idea that spouses have a, quote, marital debt, obligating them to provide the other with sex. The idea that sex is supposed to be procreative, since usually it's husbands who are wanting more of sex and more children than their wives. The idea of a marital debt tends to favor men getting more of what they want. The most successful religions in the world usually endorse a patriarchal order in which men rule over women, because this is what produces large enough families to continue passing on the religious tradition to successive generations. If the job of replenishing, say, the Jewish race were left to feminist Jewesses, like Alison Friedman, 
who only have one, possibly mixed-race, child, the Jewish race would die out. It is the religious conservative Jews who still observe traditions of male dominance in the family who are producing enough Jewish babies with their wives to keep their kind from going extinct. Occasionally, there will be a secular Jew, like Brian Kaplan, who advocates having a large family, but he and his wife don't actually have all that many kids. And even if they did, it still wouldn't make up for the Alice and Freedmans. The world Muslim population is growing rapidly partly because, unlike Christianity, it has not allowed its patriarchal principles to get watered down so much by political correctness. Patriarchy means rule by fathers. Roman Catholicism is full of patriarchal imagery, with the faithful praying to our father and addressing their priest as father as well. When they pray the Hail Mary, the woman they are describing as blessed amongst women is the one who was chosen to bear and raise God's son, as opposed to, say, like Deborah, being chosen to liberate Israel by hammering a tent pin through an enemy military commander's temple. Of course, Mary was not invited by the angel Gabriel to give affirmative consent to take on this marital role. Rather, she was considered blessed because God exercised his authority to honor her with it. Roman Catholics are not exactly what one would call staunch opponents of the idea of women making their own reproductive choices. The Catholic Church bans abortion and birth control as a way to help ensure the continuance of the species and the church. The women get pregnant outside of marriage. They can either try to trap the father into marrying them or otherwise entering into a long-term relationship with them or give the kid up for abortion, typically to a conservative Christian couple who will raise the kid in that tradition or try to raise the kid as a single mom and possibly be at risk of having the kid get taken away by CPS, which again leads to adoption typically by a Christian conservative couple. The idea that simply marrying girls off at a young age to avoid fornication, and so that biological parents can raise their kids together, doesn't seem to occur to the Catholics, or they've rejected the idea because early marriage would be too controversial, or inconsistent with the idea that young women lack the maturity to enter into a marriage, a principle that in many cases serve as a handy loophole allowing a Catholic divorce, aka annulment, if a marriage doesn't work out. While I support Roman Catholicism's goal of subordinating women as sex slaves and baby factories for their husbands, it seems that Comstock does not take patriarchal ideas to their logical conclusions to address many of the social ills about which she has expressed concern. For example, she often talks about the need to put a stop to workplace sexual harassment, including on Capitol Hill. The problem is that young, attractive women are in the workplace, where they encounter high-status men who have a natural desire to want to mate with them. It would not be better if those girls got married no later than their early teens, so that they could spend their young womanhood in the marital home under the protection of their husbands. Men will often have no qualms about behaving in a sexually aggressive way towards women who are single, also known as unowned or abandoned property, since their fathers have left them to be taken by the first comer. But they will think twice about risking the consequences of trespassing on another man's property. This would also address some of Jennifer Wexton's concerns about how so many women are getting raped. If girls were not being put in high-risk situations, such as university frat parties, where they get drunk to the point of passing out in the company of a bunch of libidinous young men, then they would probably not get raped so much. I don't blame the girls for this. I blame their fathers and or society, since society has limited fathers' ability to control their daughters for encouraging, condoning, and permitting this type of behavior, or creating the circumstances where it's most likely to happen. They were supposed to look out for those girls' safety, and they didn't. Instead, they sent them into harm's way by paying for a higher education that could have been given to a promising young man with potential to serve as patriarch of a traditional family. As Senator Wexton knows, despite the best efforts of prosecutors, most rapes of this kind will not lead to successful rape prosecutions. This is a problem that needs to be dealt with through the means other than the court system. Of course, some might argue that women who get raped in those types of circumstances were asking for it anyways, which is why they dressed that way and acted so provocatively. So, getting gang raped by a number of high-status men is a common female fantasy. That's probably true, but my point about how people are setting them up to get defiled stands. It really doesn't matter whether she supposedly consented or was raped anyways. Those are just arbitrary social constructs 
constructs that serve little purpose in such a context, and are at any rate potentially subject to being revised and reinterpreted after the fact if changing circumstances make it seem convenient to do so. Another example of this would be how Brock Turner's victim claimed she was sexually assaulted after her boyfriend found out two Swedish bicyclists had caught her getting fingered by another man behind a dumpster. Women of childbearing age should be kept out of the workplace for a variety of other reasons too, besides sexual harassment. If you're going to put a career ahead of having kids, then they're probably not doing their part to continue the human race by producing high quality offspring. But if they are going to have kids, then they're potentially inconveniencing the the whole office by going on maternity leave. The office will have to either be shorthanded for a while or bring in a temp and train them to do the job, before ultimately letting the temp go upon the female employee's return and losing their investment in training them. If a man had been in that same position, he could have stayed in his role while his wife had a kid and continued to provide value to the company and progress in his career. There is a natural order in which men are the ones who devote themselves to their jobs so that women can stay home and devote themselves fully to childbearing and child rearing. Career women miss opportunities to bond with their children by being there to hold them and breastfeed them and play with them and read to them and so on. Children generally are better taken care of by their own parents than by babysitters. Certainly kids tend to feel more comfortable in their own homes with a parent or other family member who loves them than in the home of a stranger who is taking care of them on a mercenary basis. The time kids are able to spend with their parents rather than a babysitter can be used to offer them guidance and support to help prepare them for adulthood, as opposed to the babysitters just doing the minimum of occasionally glancing away from a soap opera to make sure they don't wander out of the yard and into traffic. Sadly, with both parents typically exhausted after work, most kids don't get a lot of parenting time. Barbara Comstock wants to get more women into science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, but we are not doing these girls any favors by telling them that they can be as competent at these fields as any man or that their time would be better spent in these careers than at home having and raising kids. When they are not able to achieve as much as their male peers, they will feel like losers. They will also have a lethal effect on technological innovation in every organization they infiltrate, as they force an end to matriocratic practices and drive out the nerds who built everything from scratch. Meanwhile, the women who started families and devoted themselves to those children will feel like they have accomplished something meaningful and made a difference in the world. Those mothers don't need to get papers published in the academic press or make scientific discoveries or write software on par with men to feel successful. They can watch the progress of their sons and know that they have made their mark on the future of civilization. Those women's intelligence won't go to waste. The genes for it will be passed on to their children, with whom they can have intellectually stimulating conversations. The purpose of female intelligence is mostly to enable women to be suitable companions for men and the children they make together, and to serve as a cue to men that all else equal. Those intelligent women have a better chance than other women of being able to produce intelligent offspring. Most career women end up feeling tired and overburdened by their responsibilities. They sigh heavily, as though they are being compelled to carry the weight of the world on their weak backs. They're so different from the carefree young girls they used to be, where the happy mother's husbands bring home the bacon while they relax at home and enjoy time with their kids. The housewife gets to sip coffee in their pajamas and make their infant smile by speaking baby talk and playing peekaboo with her, while the career woman rushes in the early morning to put on her work clothes and go fight traffic. The career woman tells herself that having her own money gives her freedom, because now she can buy 300 pairs of shoes, most of which she'll maybe wear once, without having to deal with the husband complaining that she's making frivolous purchases that bury him in an avalanche of footwear when he opens the closet. When James Damore published his essay, Google's Ideological Echo Chamber, career women hated him because they couldn't face the truth that they had invested in a path that wouldn't lead them to the kind of happiness and fulfillment they could have enjoyed as trad wives. They were trying to cope by deceiving themselves, and he dropped a truth bomb on them, so they had to get rid of him. But others will take up the fight, and the truth bombs will keep coming until we put an end to the feminist social experiment, which has gone the same way as communism and and other egalitarian social experiments. If women were truly as competent as men, they would not need constant handouts and other forms of affirmative action from men in order to achieve equality in fields like STEM. 
Already, men pay the majority of taxes, yet women want more freebies. They want WIC and child support payments for men and all kinds of other forms of wealth redistribution to bail them out when they make irresponsible choices, such as bypassing all the good providers to go get impregnated by a sexy bad boy or dumping a good husband rather than raising the kid with him that would otherwise lead them down a path to giving birth in the rain in dark alleys. Feminists want women to have rights, but they don't want women to have accountability for their choices. Some might argue women bear the burden of having and taking care of children, so they deserve to have men support them financially. Yes, but one could argue with equal validity, the men who support women financially should be rewarded by those women for doing so. A lot of men are getting little or no benefit in exchange for what the state makes them pay to enable women to be mothers. The men who make child support payments but don't have to have sex with their ex-wives anymore or spend any time with their kids have not received a benefit that is proportionate to what they have to pay. The incels who have never slept with a woman at all or even held a woman's hand yet are forced to pay taxes for schools, welfare, and other support for other men's children are arguably not receiving a benefit at all because their genetic lines are coming to an end. This is why they often refer to working for a living as wage cucking. In fact, those in cells paying for women to have sex with other men and bearing children by those other men subsides and thereby enables and encourages those women's choosing those other men over them. It negates the advantage those in cells would have otherwise been able to offer in the sexual marketplace, which was that they could provide for a family. So in cells are actually incurring another cost rather than receiving a benefit in exchange for their contribution. If only a few women we're getting away with this, it might serve their feminine imperative. But since it's happening on a civilization-wide scale, it threatens the survival of the whole race because eventually women will run out of cucks to exploit. Feminism has made men less happy, but it has made women downright miserable by depriving them of the relatively cushy life that used to be their birthright. From 1999, suicide rates among white women and white men increased by 60% and 28% respectively. We need to get back to the wholesome American traditions of motherhood and apple pie if we want to restore harmony to relations between the sexes. Production of children and home-baked goods has been way down ever since women were told they should aspire for success according to the standards by which men are measured, rather than doing what would play more to their strengths. That needs to change. Let us remember that another white supremacist hero, Adolf Hitler, oh good lord, said in this speech on women, if I think to myself what a woman shall make at an appearance at an adjudication, then I have to say, when that would be a woman who was close to me, and if I wanted to imagine my mother would still be alive and has to sit in front of a murder in a court and decide the verdict never, never, we don't want that. I also don't want an uninformed female police to walk around and run after scamps and criminals. These are all things we actually don't want. Then they come naturally and say promptly, excuse me, but you don't let them into the parliaments as well. Certainly, but only because I am also satisfied that the parliament doesn't raise the value of the woman, but it would only degrade her. I removed the men from the parliamentary service as well. In former times, I was often told, don't you think that if you get the woman in the Reichstag, that the women would refine the manners of the Reichstag then and thereby? I even have no interest to refine the Reichstag or to refine its manners at all, because whether honored, knighted, or ennobled is ranting or not, that is entirely the same. Above all, I am also convinced that, for example, the parliament at the time was nothing more than a sack of rotten apples. Now, you will say to me, that's why you should put some sound ones into it now. No, I prefer to leave the sound ones out, lest they become rotten too. It's better to let something die, which is destined to die. When I look around the world today, the picture from the papers that comes to mind is a woman's regiment in the Soviet Union for sharpshooting, or a woman's battalion of grenadiers in Spain, or all I can say to the representatives of this type of female equality. I would not be a man if I wanted to tolerate such a thing. I experienced the war. I know how hard it is. I know how many men's nerves have been shattered by this war. I have often seen them return by the dozens, doddering completely ruined and broken. The idea that a girl or a woman has to take it upon herself, I could have no respect for the German men then. Either they take responsibility for this or they shall resign. As long as we have a healthy male gender and we national socialists will ensure it, 
No female grenadiers and sharpshooters will be trained in Germany. There is no equality, but in reality, inferior rights for women. Because it's harder for women than for men. For her, it is much more terrible than for men. I could say just as well that I am arming children in the future and sending them to war. We won't do it. But apart from that, before our very eyes, there is a vast expanse of job opportunities for the woman. Because for us, the woman has been the most faithful work and life companion of the man at all times. They often said, you want to remove women from all professions. On the whole, I will only give her the chance of being able to marry and to assist her to found an own family and to have children. Because she would then, and this is my conviction now, benefit our people the most, of course. For that's clear. And you need to understand me. If I have a female lawyer in front of me these days, and it doesn't matter how much she has achieved, and next to her is a mother of five, six, seven children, and they are in great health and well educated by her, then I want to say, from the eternal point of view of the eternal value of our people, the woman, who is able to have children and has children and raise them, and thereby gave our people the further ability to live in the future, has achieved more. She has done more. She assists us to avoid the death of our people. Some libertarians would say that patriarchy is unlibertarian because women are self-owners. I would not categorize them as such. The category they fall into is closer to that of children, who emotionally bond with their fathers and need to be taken care of by them. A woman will always look at her husband or some other male authority figure as her leader. Without such leadership, she is at a loss as to what to do. One might argue, women should have freedom to choose their own mates, rather than have the choice made for them by their fathers, and then leave them if they feel unhappy in the relationship. One of the first legal reforms that feminists typically try to make in a patriarchist country is to permit women to file for divorce. The problem with this is that it allows women to perpetrate fraud, in which they break the marital contract which obligates them to stay with their husbands and raise their kids together. Fraud is an initiation of force. It is a violation of the non-aggression principle, and it leads to other forms of aggression, as the fatherless sons are more likely to become criminals themselves. When a man's wife attempts to leave and take the children with her, he has a right to use retaliatory force in defense of his rights, so that he can preserve the family unit. Some men make the mistake of thinking that they can just appease women by giving them all the equal rights, or even superior rights, that they demand, and that women will then leave them alone in peace and not bother them. This is not true. What will actually happen is that as men grant women more and more concessions, women will continue to demand more, and subject the majority of men to worse and worse mistreatment. As more girls grow up without strong father figures, they will tend to suffer from mental illnesses, and they will engage in promiscuity and other self-destructive behaviors. Those girls will also tend to end up with some of the worst men out there, since they will have low self-esteem and think it is all they deserve. Without the protection of a father, they will be preyed upon by the bad elements of society. And so, even though patriarchy may theoretically free women from cruel and domineering male authority figures, women will still be treated poorly because they will harm themselves, including by seeking after men who will harm them. The situation will continue to worsen, as female misbehavior spirals out of control until men finally understand what is going on and put women in their place. We can either accept the truth and take action now to fix the problem, or we can kick the can down the road and wait till the situation becomes absolutely intolerable. It would be less selfish though, and more courageous, to address it now rather than leaving it up to a future generation. We can prevent more damage from being inflicted by stepping up to the plate and doing what must be done. There is a myth that men can lie down and rest, or lie down and rot, i.e. give up and let the feminists take over and just ignore women, as though they don't exist, or at least refuse to commit to them, and minimize their dealings with them to incidental contact, such as when they have to order a cheeseburger from a female cashier. This is untrue. Men have no place they can run or hide from ill-behaved women, but rather, feminists will do whatever they can to make the world a living hell for the majority of men. They will intrude into the lives of these men men who attempt to shut them out, demanding entry into every male-only space or seeking to shut those spaces down. We see this, for example, in the tech world, where codes of conduct are promulgated requiring gender inclusiveness. The only option left for men is to fight back against the feminists, to subjugate women and force them into submission. Freedom of speech. As a dissident politician, naturally I am a strong supporter of freedom of speech. I am against laws criminalizing so-called hate speech, since I agree with what Louis Brandeis wrote that the wide difference between advocacy and incitement, between preparation and attempt, between assembling and conspiracy, must be borne in the mind. 
Brandeis, as a Jew, was perhaps intending mostly to help communists by removing restrictions on their speech, but his logic could apply equally to those who speak anti-Semitic truths, since Whitney v. California was decided in 1927. Silencing National Socialists would presumably not have been on Brandeis's mind. The suppression of hate speech makes people suspect that maybe the censors are trying to hide something. It often increases, rather than decreases, the reach of the suppressed content, as people's curiosity is piqued. I am for legalization of child pornography, possession, and distribution, because important truths about human condition and human sexuality in particular might be revealed in this art form. This is especially true given that child porn tends to be created by amateurs who have a relationship, such as a familial tie, with each other. The Vicky series would be an example of this, although some in the alt-right might claim that incest is a degeneracy that Jewish leftists are trying to promote. In reality, Jewish feminist psychiatrists, such as Judith Lewis Herman, author of Father-Daughter Incest, crusaded against letting fathers have the power to do as they wished with their daughters. The Justice Department even admits that child porn may depict children that appear complacent. Leftists used child pornography laws as a tool to try and destroy Kevin Alfred Strom's career and reputation. In a 2012 a U.S. Sentencing Commission study found that 89.9% of those convicted of child pornography possession are white. So it does seem like these laws are being used to target white America for persecution. As Justices Brennan and Marshall Note in their concurrence in New York v. Ferber, it is inconceivable how a depiction of a child that is itself a serious contribution to the world of art or literature or science can be deemed material outside the protection of the First Amendment. At any rate, as a practical matter, technologies such as Tales and Veracrypt have already made it much harder to gather usable evidence with which to prosecute child porn offenders, so the law is becoming less enforceable. I support the abolition of intellectual property by striking out the enumerated power in Article 1, Section 8 of Congress to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. Intellectual property protections infringe the right of people to do as they wish with their physical property, e.g., by using their computers to copy software. These laws also stifle innovation by preventing the creation of derivative works without the permission of the copyright owner, who, in the case of orphan works, is unreachable. Benjamin Franklin never sought a patent or copyright, writing in his autobiography. As we enjoy great advantages from the inventions of others, we should be glad of an opportunity to serve others by any invention of ours. And this we should do freely and generously. Intellectual property is the silent killer of free speech. When you go to Wikipedia and see a low-quality photo of a celebrity instead of a professional photo, that's because of copyright. Perhaps someone posted a better photo, but it was deleted because it couldn't be proven to Wikipedians satisfaction that it wasn't a copyright violation. It may be that the creator of the photo would not have minded having his work shared, and perhaps he even sent an email granting permission, but a bunch of red tape got in the way of it actually being used, because the prescribed procedure for verifying agreement to release the work into the Creative Commons wasn't allowed. Movie scripts often call for a particular song to be played, but the filmmakers will have to settle for using a different song instead because the rights of the song they want can't be secured. For decades, the song Happy Birthday to You wasn't used in films and TV shows because of the copyright concerns, which perhaps is just as well because it's a boring and trite song. But I imagine that sometimes scenes had to be written to work around this. Freedom from age restrictions. There should be no age-based restrictions on voting or holding office. The best way for young people to learn about politics is through participation in the political process, rather than by passively hearing about it in school. Young people tend to be on the cultural and technological cutting edge, so it is beneficial to hear their perspective, if for no other reason than to stay apprised of these trends, rather than losing touch with what is happening. It is also possible that there could be some prodigies who are capable of better leadership than many adults. I call for repeal of the National Minimum Drinking Age Act. I think alcohol should be subject to no more regulations than any other consumable product, such as milk or soft drinks. I support legalizing early marriage, all else equal. A woman who marries the man 
to whom she gives her virginity to is more likely to have a successful marriage than a woman who has had other sexual relationships prior to marriage, since young women begin to enter their years of peak beauty and fertility before age 18. It is unreasonable and unrealistic to expect that they wait till that age before having sex in children. Statistics show that the current age of virginity loss is 17.2 years old for women, which suggests that the marriageable age is so high that they are unwilling to wait that long. Although incel literally means involuntarily celibate, the incel movement also contains some men who could get sex but remain voluntarily celibate because they don't like the idea that the high marriageable age gives Chad the droit du seigneur over the girls they would like to have. As Jim's blog notes, 90% of men never get to pop a virgin. Every man, except for a rather small handful of men, are getting sloppy seconds. The Fair Labor Standards Act, or FLSA, should be repealed. The FLSA sets a minimum working age of 14, but that should be done away with, since it's better to encourage boys to get involved in the workplace from as young an age as possible, since boys reach sexual maturity in their early teens. The goal should be to prepare them for early marriage by getting them experience in the work world, so they can support a young wife. This will help reduce the marital age gaps after early marriage is implemented. Some may argue that children should be in school rather than working, but it is possible to do both. In fact, students often find that what they learn in school is more meaningful to them if they are working in a field that is relevant to their studies. There should be a strong push to get young men involved in the trades, so that an increased supply of skilled labor can push down the price of services such as plumbing, electrical work, etc., and make home ownership less expensive. The trades also permit young men to begin getting paid as apprentices rather than having to take unpaid internships as college students might. The current law allows young kids to do agricultural work, which probably is in recognition of the harsh economic realities of farming, but otherwise it doesn't make a lot of sense, since farming is probably more dangerous than non-agricultural work. If someone happens to switch on a corn harvester while you're reaching into the mechanism to unclog it, you're probably going to lose your arm. If you're going to allow that, then we may as well allow kids to work in less dangerous settings like offices and retail jobs. Getting kids into the workforce at a young age will help relieve some of their boredom, since even if their job is boring, at least they'll have some spending money and keep them out of trouble. They can have a sense of pride in their accomplishments. Being able to provide for a wife and have the sexual intimacy that goes along with that will tend to be emotionally and psychologically beneficial for teenage men. Boy lovers claim in The Parable of the Automobile that man-boy sex is only harmful because society prohibits it. This is a hypothesis that perhaps should be tested in one of our laboratories of democracy. The issues of pedophilia and adult-child sex may or may not be very important in and of themselves but one's stance on those issues is symbolic of one's approach towards difficult issues in general, where there is a mainstream narrative that can't be challenged without going outside the Overton window. A lot of people probably would say that there should be no Overton window, and that we should approach all issues with an open mind, until someone asks whether they would take that open-mindedness so far as to look at the idea of sex with children with the same kind of logical and evidence-based approach that, say, atheists pride themselves on using when they're considering the likelihood that the Christian God exists. Maybe it's no coincidence, then, that Richard Dawkins ended up being the one who got in trouble for saying that all those who sexually touch children do lasting harm. It's not that he lacks the Christian moral compass. He may also look at issues with a skeptical mind even when the dogma being presented is secular. It's also symbolic of one's willingness to say that maybe some transvaluation has taken place, with those who are claiming to be victims actually being the oppressors. If one can accept that Kylie Freeman has behaved badly towards Kenneth Freeman and other child pornography offenders, then maybe one can also accept that Jews have victimized some of those whom they have extorted for Holocaust reparations. As the feminists inform us, adult child sex is a feminist issue, so our views on the topic may reflect our views on feminism as a whole. The most radical patriarchists will tend to favor letting men have sex with the little girls they own. What I have in common with most of society, including my political opponents, is that I consider these issues a litmus test. Any system that makes children useful to society, whether through child labor, early marriage, or by other means, will tend to help address modernity's fertility problem by creating incentives to have more children suicide rights. Many of the other issues I mentioned above are also relevant to suicide rights, legalizing barbiturates, heavy machine guns, etc. 
makes available, reliable, and peaceful means of suicide for those who need them. Discrimination rights. The state arbitrarily allows discrimination in some contexts while banning it in others. For example, a consumer is free to discriminate against gay bakers, but a baker is forbidden from discriminating against gay customers. Likewise, people are allowed to discriminate by, say, only inviting white friends to a social gathering. But we can't discriminate based on race in our employment or housing decisions. We should allow everyone to do as they wish with their own property. After releasing his manifesto, Nathan was laughed out of the political arena. He was mocked, and during a debate, the candidates spoke about how the decision to give rights and the ability to run for elected office back to felons had been a mistake, given Nathan's candidacy. Nathan, ever the intellectual, sensed that he wasn't being taken seriously, as most people were disgusted by his points of view, and withdrew from the election. He tried to lend his support to another candidate who promptly rejected it, saying he'd rather lose than be endorsed by a pedophile. Nathan seemingly retired from public life after his 2018 campaign, but kept himself busy while living at home with his parents by running more incel-adjacent websites and running several social media accounts under different names. Though Nathan had maintained multiple times in court that he would never actually touch a child, but just wanted it to be legal just in case, after his campaign ended, he began to obsess about the idea of controlling and sexually assaulting a child. He had surrounded himself with people who, serious or not, would openly discuss wanting to be with children, or having been with them, and he believed it was the obvious next step. Nathan would take images of attractive young men from social media and make various accounts with the photos under fake names. He would pretend to be anywhere between 18 to 25 and post regular selfies, looking for young girls to interact with. Utilizing apps like Discord, Kick, and more, he would groom young girls who he got into contact with, showering them with praise and telling them how beautiful and funny they were. After multiple messages, he would request they send naked photos and videos of themselves. And if they refused, he blocked them or stopped responding entirely. It is currently unknown how many girls Nathan did this to, but according to the police and prosecution, because of how tactful he was, it was clear that he had done this more than once. But just getting them to send child sexual abuse images wasn't enough. He wanted to go further, and so he closed in on one girl he had been talking to who was 12 years old. According to various articles, this girl was going through a great deal of grief at home and felt as though Nathan provided her with a level of understanding that she didn't get elsewhere. She opened up to him about her depression and her family life, and he, pretending to be a 25-year-old, told her she meant the world to him and it hurt him to see her so sad. He told her that he would save her, and he convinced her to run away from home to live with him. He bought her a long-haired wig to disguise herself and told her that when they were in public, she needed to act like she was developmentally impaired. That way, no one would speak to her. Nathan met up with her at an airport in California, where the two behaved inappropriately together. They then got on a plane heading towards Virginia, where he lived with his parents. A friend of hers reported that she had run away with an adult man, and when the plane touched down in Colorado for a layover, the pair was intercepted and she was reunited with her family, while Nathan was arrested. As of now, Nathan is in jail, awaiting his trial for five charges, including attempted kidnapping, child abduction, soliciting child pornography from a minor, and meeting a child for the intention of sex, along with a misdemeanor charge of harboring a minor. Nathan has pleaded not guilty to the charges and wants to represent himself in court as he wants to use the trial to talk about how his rights as a pedophile are being taken away. However, the judge has rejected that outright and he is being represented by a court-appointed lawyer. As of now, he is facing the minimum charge of 20 years in prison and the maximum of life without parole. Nathan is by far one of the worst people we have covered on this channel. He is proudly racist, misogynistic, anti-Semitic, and a pedophile. He deserves to be in prison, and I doubt he will see the light of day again. Thank you for watching. If you have made it through the entire video, please consider leaving a like, as it does help us in the algorithm. And please subscribe if you haven't already. If you can, consider supporting us via Patreon. And we will see you in the next video. Stay safe.